Hey, how's it going? When it comes to pre-evolved runs, there are a few types that I haven't done yet, and this week I'm going to jump into the fighting type for Gen 1. You have two choices here, and obviously I chose Machop, but that's not to say I don't think the other option in Mankey wouldn't be interesting as well. At the end of the day, these Pokemon are very similar, and they'll use very similar movesets, but I've seen a Mankey run already on J Rose's channel, and I'll go with Machop just for the sake of variety. And if you've browsed the channel for a while, you know that Machamp was one of the first evolved how fast runs that I did, and it's just an app absolute unit. My initial thoughts was that if Machop can live up to even a fraction of that, then we might have a pretty good run on our hands, maybe even a top 5 shakeup in the tier list. One last thing I would like to talk about is another reason I went with Machop is because it starts off with Karate Chop, whereas Mankey has to kind of fumble around with Scratch and Leer until it gets Karate Chop at level 15. And these are just kind of my preliminary thoughts. And I'll get into some details about where things went right and wrong when we get into the actual run. But first let me say that I do put Pokemon solo runs fairly often, and if that is of interest to you, consider subscribing to the channel. Likes and comments also help out the channel and build that community, and if you are someone that never interacts with content, just do me a solid here. Scroll down real quick and type in Choppy Dude to potentially help a small channel get into that YouTube algorithm and get it recommended to more people. Now just sit back, grab yourself a Sodi Pop, and let's see how a fighting Pokemon stacks up in our ever-growing tier list. Right from the start, I make sure that my Machop has good IVs, and in honor of the Machamp run where it was named Hurt Fuel, I named it Hurt Jr. because that's all that's going to fit within the character limit. The first rival fight isn't much of an issue. Starting with Karate Chop is pretty great, at least on paper. I've talked about moves like Slash, Karate Chop, Crab Hammer, and in runs where I've had access to them, they are just excellent. 8x crit multipliers do a ton of damage, and they can just slice through basically any minor trainer, especially if you outlevel them. And now it's time for some run defined decisions. Like with other runs, taking on the optional rival fight while I'm passing through Viridian is a great way to save some time if you can pull it off. And this fight just isn't great, and doing it at level 6 does take about a dozen attempts to get through. And I'd like to take this time to talk about a critical shortcoming of Machamp. In the Machamp run, its one Achilles heel was that it had lower speed for a second stage Pokemon, so it goes without saying that Machop has this problem but amplified times 10. It's an extremely low 35 base speed Pokemon and that is going to bring about some problems as the run goes on. Specifically right here starting with Karate Chop and having that low speed is a huge problem and I'm going to take this battle to go over the details so I don't have to harp on it the rest of the video but at 35 base speed Machop has a very low 6.84% crit rate and if you factor in the times 8 multiplier Karate Chop only has a 54.7 chance to crit so it's basically a coin flip and while it doesn't look too bad on paper and actually practice a move whose raw power comes from crits feels very bad when it doesn't crit which feels like it just disappoints me and doesn't crit a ton and there are lots of spots in this battle and many more to come where a crit would be all that I need but it just fails to deliver as for the actual battle I just don't really have enough stats to get through it karate chop being a normal type move rather than a stabbed fighting move and only having a 50 base power means that I just don't have the juice here most fights end slowly getting whittled down as I desperately hope for that Karate Chop crit. Some attempts end with getting Sand Attack several times, but I just refuse to show those out of principle alone because I hate Sand Attack. On the attempt I finally do make it through, it's absurdly lucky, and that's going to be a theme for the run. The Pidgey is going for straight Gust, and I go all the way down to 3 HP, and this one just looks doomed. With the match all but over, it does go for a Sand Attack, but miraculously it misses, and that just gives me an opening to finish it off. I level up, I go to 6 HP, but I'm going to need a lot of help here and a turn one grout isn't great but remember that crits do ignore stat changes obviously my chop isn't going to crit and I take a tackle I'm at 2 HP at this point Bulbasaur gives me the opening I need with two straight growls afterwards and it all comes down to rolling the dice here I need a non-attacking move and I need karate chop to crit so it goes for a leech seed and I do actually get the crit and I finally get through this grueling early game challenge by the smallest and unlikely of margins and I also get 
two levels out of it to boot. Now from there it's pretty straightforward. There are three bug catchers I can challenge for some fairly easy battles. I don't have any trouble on them and if you battle a, just a few Kakunas on your way through the forest you can get up to level 12. With that little bit of extra experience that means that if you challenge the junior trainer right before Brock in another pretty easy battle this can elevate you all the way up to level 14 before diving into the next challenge of our run. Our dad Machamp started out with low kick but Machop does not learn that to level 20 so it looks like we're gonna have to be doing this without it and that's not too great. I've given you the numbers for the crit rate of Karate Chomp and all I can really say is that a battle like this is where the frustration can really come out. Although the numbers tell us that it's slightly higher than a coin flip to get the crit, it's just really disheartening when you see three, four, maybe even five or more straight turns where it doesn't crit. Using a normal move against two Pokemon that are defensive in general and they just resist it is a bit of a slog and you're essentially at the mercy of the luck gods for this one. It goes without saying that this battle takes me quite some time to finally get through and at this early point in the run, I was kind of wondering what type of run this would turn out to be. I see a lot of potential in Machop, but I was hoping that this would more or less be a Bellsprout situation where you spend a decent amount of total time to get through the fights, but the actual in-game time is still going to look great. Now I'm not giving up yet, but to cut a long story short and save you guys watching me slap a wet noodle on Brock's Pokemon about a hundred times, let's just skip ahead to what works due to the magic of video editing. Looking ahead, only having a single move means that we cannot avoid Bide from Onyx, so the Geodude section needs to have a couple of things happen more often than anything else. The first obvious thing is that you want as many Karate Chop crits as you can possibly get, and the second thing is that you would like to see a pretty absurd amount of defense curls. These two things synergize very well since crits ignore those stat changes, and the one goal here is to avoid as much damage as possible to have some insurance against the Onyx. Overall, I end up only taking minimal tackles in this attempt, and you don't see all the other attempts, but bad RNG can lead you to very low health. So just like with the optional rival fight, luck is definitely needed here if you want to have a shot at doing this without having to grind and, and up your in-game time. Now let's finally take a look at the Onyx, and in a perfect world, you would crit every single time, and it would just go for nothing but Screech, but obviously that's not going to happen. Bides don't feel good, and this is the one time where you would actually probably hope that they don't crit, because if it lasts three turns, and you crit three times, you're going to take a ton of damage. At the end of the day, it's really down to being at the mercy of whatever the game just wants to give you. Like I said earlier, I tried this fight a ton, and in this successful attempt, I barely scraped by. I'm at 2 HP, it goes for a bide, and I just managed to do enough damage before I take that lethal damage to finally finish off this fight. And you might be thinking, Matt, this is such a rough start, how is Machop's time at the point? And like I alluded to with Bellsprout having to retry battles at no cost to the end game time, the route and the struggle so far, it, we're actually at a very solid 22 minutes after Brock, and that should set us up to maybe not compete with Ghastly, but at least be looking at those other spots. From there, as you might have guessed, the trainer battles up to and inside of Mount Moon are nothing compared to what we've already done, and it's pretty easy just to slam through all of them with Karate Chop. The one thing to note during this part is having access to Mega Punch. It's like Body Slam's little brother, but it only has 85% accuracy, but we only have one move, and since we can't really rely on the crits from Karate Chop consistently, it helps to have this move to smooth things out a little bit. But first up is going to be rival number two, and I lose this fight quickly because I'm an idiot, I forgot to heal, and you might wonder why I don't just edit that out, but I enjoy showing my mistakes and pitfalls rather than just present a perfect run for you guys. I'm really stubborn, and wouldn't you know that I decided that I wanted to squeeze as much juice out of my end game time as I could, and I go back in without healing. Just like with all rival number two fights, it's easy to get past if you just avoid pesky things from the Pidgeotto. I do take a sand attack and some minor damage, but a couple of mega punches gets us through. I level up a 20, I get access to low kick, and I basically just sweep through the rest of the fight despite starting it at low HP. This allows me to keep going a little bit longer than I would have and allows me to ultimately heal, finish up the route to Bill's house, and that leads us to the second gym fight. Just like with the second rival fight, I'm trying to save all the time that I can, and I enter this fight at about half HP. This is kind of a double-edged sword, and although I don't do awful in the fight, I lose the first attempt, but I do get the star me down to about 33% health, and that's that's pretty promising. I lose a few times, and I finally just bite the bullet. I use a couple of potions so I don't have to be here all day. You'd figure it would make the fight much better, but obviously Misty is just going to crit a bunch, and I lose just the same on this attempt. It's still not an easy fight, but eventually after about 7 or 8 attempts, I get some crits here and there. 
I avoid getting blasted by a bubble beam crit, and I take the fight. I level up to 25 after getting the win here. Now let's move it along to the SSN. I do pick up Body Slam in case I grow tired of Karate Chop's fickle crit rate, and I pick up the rare candy locked behind the gentleman before moving on to rival number 3. This fight looks like it's going to go awful. Mega Punch shows its true colors, and I miss multiple times while I get gusted down to about half health before I'm eventually able to get the Pidgeotto down. You might be wondering why I didn't just replace that with Body Slam. And the idea here was that it has more PP and to avoid Poke Centers as much as I can and have the best run possible, I need to use up all of Mega Punch's PP first, but I digress. It is what it is. You take the good with the bad with Mega Punch. After that, I do have Low Kick for Raticate, so it's not an issue, but now it's time for that Kadabra and we have a big weakness to the usual boogeyman to a lot of our runs. I get hit with Confusion and I go all the way down to 4 HP, but I am able to finish off the battle. I barely hang on. Now it's time for Ivysaur and I need some more of that precious luck. Machop needs all the luck. I need Mega Punch to not miss and I need a non-attacking move and Arceus does smile upon me and that's exactly what happens to get past this battle. That didn't look great from the start, but I ended up pulling it out in the first attempt. So that's pretty great considering we've already had several battles take quite a bit of retries early in the game. I finish up, I see the SSN off and that means it's immediately time for the third gym battle against Lieutenant Surge. But first I'm going to bring attention to something that's a first for me. I get the trash can puzzle on Lieutenant Surge on the very first attempt. More than that, the first trash can I checked had the first button and then the second one, it was just one and done. I've never had that happen before. But did you guys notice the man pop up on the screen when the dialogue came up? I was really confused when I was editing this back. Um, and who are you little man? Maybe he has the legendary tombstone or TM. As for Surge, it's not too bad. At first I was thinking it could potentially be another battle I had to reset a lot for, but it's actually a one shot victory. Machop has great attack and the Mega Punches just shred through the first two Pokemon. Thunderbolt would definitely hurt from the Raichu, but we never even see it. Surge goes for an X speed and then he goes for a Growl, which doesn't matter since I just crit anyway on the following Karate Chop. And just like that, three badges are down and things are definitely getting a little better. We're starting to hit our stride a little bit here. I have a low kick for Rock Tunnel, so let's just jump ahead to Cerulean. I do the usual errands, but I do pick up a Poke Dog because this might be a mimic run. Machop can also learn Rock Slide, so a Sodi Pop to the little girl gets us that. From there, it's time to tackle the Rocket Hideout, and after minimum battles, it's time to take a look at the first Giovanni fight. I do fail the first attempt because once again, I'm not at full health because I'm not taking it seriously, I guess. Kangaskhan does go full cheat mode on me and hits a five turn critical hit Comet Punch that absolutely blasts me, and that forces a reset, so let's just look at the next attempt. And it's much better. I'll just take this time to talk about Low Kick. It's not the world's best move, but fighting moves are severely limited in Gen 1. It being 100% accurate and getting stabbed makes it reliable at the very least. In a fight like this where you have two rock tops and a normal top, it really shines. I haven't talked about it much so far, but there are just a ton of normal tops hanging out in Kanto, so it definitely comes in handy in this or maybe even the double Geodude and Graveler Hiker and Rock Tunnel. Those are probably the best examples of where it just shines the brightest. But you can see how little damage Comet Punch normally does, and that's Giovanni number one finish. And guys, I almost forgot the Sylph Scope here, but I remembered at the very last second and I got it, and that would have been very detrimental to the run, especially when I have such high hopes for it. But no harm, no foul, let's move on. Now I made kind of a risky call here. I'm gonna go ahead and make my way to Erica just to see how it goes. I'm not gonna make a save just in case it goes awful, but I think the reason I tried this would be just so I don't have to forget Erica. I'll always forget her. I don't know why, and that would cost me some time, so I I'm gonna see how it goes. Victory Bell is scary, and in this attempt, it's a prime example of Machop's low speed being a huge detriment. I get wrapped into a Razor Leaf, into another wrap, and that just finishes me off. The damage I do isn't awful, but I do get handled fairly easily, and I decide just to cut my losses, reload for my previous save, and move on. This means our next objective is Pokemon Tower to face a much easier opponent in rival number four. And Rock Slide is just so dominant in this fight, especially since I chose Bulbasaur due to its poison typing resisting fighting. It's great against Pidgeotto, Gyarados, Growlithe. And at this point, I don't think I've mentioned it, but I do have Body Slam now over Mega Punch since probably about Rock Tunnel. And those two moves combined are enough just to easily take the fight. Kadabra just wastes its turn, so it's not an issue. And overall, it's just a speed bump. I finish up the tower. I grab the Poke Flu, and I make my way down to Fuchsia, but only to get the flight path because I need a little power boost before taking on Koga. This means it's time for a quick dip into Silph Co, and the goal here is to get Earthquake. I go ahead and I teach it over Karate Chop.
shop on a lot of Pokemon, it might be worth hanging on to those near guaranteed crit moves, but I've just seen enough of it with Machop. It doesn't crit enough for my taste. It's just not reliable, and Body Slam, I think, is just overall more consistent, and it has the paralysis proc, so I just think it's better for this situation. And this is normally where runs that have a psychic weakness have their first run in with the more powerful psychic types, and while I do get blasted and could have had a hard time if the AI did all the correct moves, I really didn't have too much of a problem here. I get past all the jugglers. I didn't even have to reset once. And although I do take some pretty nice damage, my high attack stat combined with powerful moves can just carry me through this. Now it's time for Koga. I enter the fight poisoned, but the more pressing problem is that Earthquake at our level just isn't good enough to one-shot the coughing. So that means by extension, it's also not going to one-shot the muck or the wheezing as well. This means I need an extra move, which means the extra damage from their turns or poison will just start racking up. And when a body slam fails to take out the muck after the first earthquake, I get nuked down and the first attempt ends right there. I go back in with the adjustments of healing poison and not just going for body slam on muck. The fight plays out very similar, but like I said, I do a second earthquake this time to take out the muck. The second coughing plays out exactly like the first one and the wheezing is tanky, but earthquake looks to be a two shot. I do take a sludge followed by a toxic and since it didn't go for self destruct, a second super effective quake does allow me to take this battle. The very, very important part of this fight is that I get that speed badge boost which Machop desperately needs. Now is the time I call an audible and a solo run first for me. I think the rival number 5 fight is just going to roll me and I don't have many options outside of going to face Erica. but I think the experience that'll give is pretty negligible in the grand scheme of things. The solution to this conundrum is to grab the good rod and fuchsia, catch a polywag outside of town, and now I have access to Cinnabar a little earlier than I normally do. I do go ahead and pick up the last remaining HMs while I'm here and before I completely forget about Erica, I'm going to make sure I head over there first since now I have more levels and the speed badge boost this time. Earthquake's neutral damage to the bells, poison grass topping means I can do heavy damage but it's not a one shot. It hangs on but fortunately it misses a poison powder and this battle was looking like it's in the bag. Tangela is forever weak and it goes down to a critical hit body slam and just to show how lucky Machop can be, the game gives me a second critical hit in a roll with our very low 6.8% chance to crit. Guys, I barely hit two karate chop crits back to back, so this is honestly a little nutty, but that's just Erica down, and now I don't have to worry about forgetting her. Now it's time for our favorite swim of the week down to Cinnabar, and it's interrupted by a very rare level 40 tentacle. Very cool. The overall decision to come here is a no-brainer for me. We have high attack, we have rock side, we have earthquake, so it should be a great matchup, and the extra experience from the optional battles can kind of alleviate some of that difficulty in the remaining fights, as well as give us that tiny special badge boost that may or may not even matter against the upcoming Alakazams that we're going to be seeing. I demolish all of the extra trainers, and after answering some questions about Tombstoner, brother, it's time to battle Blaine. This fight is about what you would expect. Barring getting crit or maybe locked into a fire spin infinite loop, there's not really much to stand in our way of victory here. I do have Earthquake and Rock Slide. It does massive super effective damage like I mentioned, and even though Arcanine does some decent damage with takedown, a couple of quakes makes this very painless and makes me feel pretty good about my decision to come here and doing a route change up in this run. I'm not going to reveal the end game times just yet, but suffice it to say that Machop is doing very well, so I'm immediately going to face rival number 5 to see if I can pull out a win here and keep going strong to see how long our choppy boy can keep this up. And this fight is pretty awful. It opens up with a wing attack crit for heavy super effective damage and then the rock slide fails to knock it out. I take even more damage, then the Gyarados comes in, rock slide can't one hit it either, and I take a dragon rage to chuck me all the way down to a mere 19 hit points. I play it out, but at such low health, Alakazam is just going to have Machop for breakfast and that's it. I fail a lot and there's no two ways about it. I need levels, I have to go grind, and the dream of magically being in the same tier as Ghastly, it ends here guys, sorry to say. I go off and I grind most of the trainers in Sylph because I either need to outspeed the Pidgeot or I need to make Rock Slide a one hit, which is more likely considering our base speed stat. This gets us about four levels overall, and I'm hoping that's all the extra in-game time I'll need to spend solving this problematic battle. So let's dive in and see how it changes things, and immediately you can see it paying dividends. Now I not only outspeed the Pidgeot, but Rock Slide can also one-shot it, which is just a beautiful thing to see. It makes me very hopeful. Gyarados, on the other hand, still is not a one-shot, but it does waste its turn, and I can just take it out in the next turn, so that's great. 
Geralt is whatever, and I could always take this puppy out. No need to talk about it any further. Alakazam is the real worry here. I don't outspeed it. It goes for confusion. At least it doesn't crit, but it does do some really good damage, but it isn't too bad. And I use my turn with an earthquake that is more than enough to take out this frail cat creature with a very impressive mustache. Venusaur is last, and although earthquake is neutral, I opt to go for body slam for what I assume is probably for the paralysis proc. I don't know how the past Matt was thinking, but either way, two of them are enough to take it out, and I take this one on the first attempt after grinding, and that's a relief to keep our total time to down to respectable levels despite having to do some extra things. Next up is Giovanni number two, and this is always the dessert after the rival number five dinner. I have all the moves required to make this an easy fight. I don't even heal, and I'm able just to tear through this battle no problems like you'd probably expect. Now let's move on to some more pressing matters. Sabrina has potential to be one of the worst trainers in the game for Machop. All of her Pokemon can deal heavy damage to me, and it's all on display during the first battle. It starts off with a Kadabra. It outspeeds me. It does a ton of damage before I finally take it out. I'm able to get past the next two Pokemon, but Earthquake does not take out the Venomoth, and I take even more damage before getting to the Alakazam. The only win con I have here is if it wastes two turns, but it does a turn one reflect, which means it can comfortably survive my move, and then it just takes me out on the next turn. And after that, Kadabra just decides to make my life a living hell. If it's not critting me and one-shotting me, it's doing enough heavy damage to where I can't finish off the fight. This goes on for several times, and I see so many psychic critical hits here that it's making me honestly a little upset. But persistence is the key here, guys, and eventually I do get the attempt that goes our way. Kadabra is still acting up, but psychic doesn't crit, and it only blows off one of our legs, so I'm still able to hobble my way to the rest of the fight. Interestingly enough, Earthquake is a range on the Venomoth, so that lets me avoid more damage, and finally it's time for the Alakazam. So what needs to happen to win here? It goes for one of the worst moves in the game in Side Wave. It gets a low roll on its damage, and I'm able just to Earthquake it and win just like that. This was a scary fight, and it took a little patience, but it's done with, and the crisis is averted. There's only two more Alakazams that are probably better than this one left, so they won't be an issue probably. My therapist says that if I close my eyes and count to three, that Alakazam can't hurt me, so I'm going to believe in that. Afterwards, I pick up Mimic because I get the feeling that this will be needed for this run. And after that, I quickly dip back into the Celadon Pokemart to up my speed stat with some vitamins and get whatever little advantages that I can to smooth out these final fights. Now that leaves the final gym fight left. And just like with all the other Giovanni battles, I'm still very well equipped to make this one easy. The trio is just a weak piece of paper, but every other Pokemon takes heavy, super effective earthquake damage. The Rhyhorn and the Rhydon can survive but they can't really retaliate well and overall it's just kind of the cherry on top for a pretty great run up to this point but I don't think anyone watching this thought that this would give me any sort of challenge so let's kind of move forward to the meat and the potatoes of the run. In preparation for the final fight I do replace Low Kick with Mimic since Earthquake more or less handles all the things that Low Kick would do in the Elite Four but let's take a look at rival number six. On the Pidgeot the play here is very obvious. I'm taking agility with Mimic and I'm ramping up my stats but I am cautious. I only set up one agility because I get the feeling that I'll level up. This means my rock slide will not one shot it and since I'm fighting type the AI will choose between agility or a flying type move and I do get a little unlucky here. I take a wing attack for some pretty nice damage but it's all good. Next up is Rhyhorn and there really isn't anything to be concerned about here. Let's just earthquake this weird creature and be on our way. Gyarados is third and we've seen earlier that rock slide can't one hit it. Thankfully it just goes for a leer on its turn and I take it out on the following turn but more importantly, my intuition was correct and I do level up. This means that Growlithe comes in and I have two agilities left to do and hopefully that's going to carry me for the rest of the fight. Fortunately, Growlithe also has agility which means that's all it'll use against me since I'm fighting top and I take it out and let's see how the tough parts of the fight go. And with those two agilities, it's key. Now I outspeed and the Alakazam crisis is averted with a single Earthquake. Venusaur is next and Earthquake looks to be a two shot so this should be pretty comfortable but it decides to do a razor leaf that always crits and now I'm getting very low. The subsequent earthquake actually isn't a two shot and it survives on like 3 HP and I'm in trouble here but Machop is the world's luckiest Pokemon. It only goes for a growth and that means I take this battle on the first try and it goes without saying that that's fantastic news for the run and it has me feeling great. Overall Machop has been great up to this point outside of having to reset a lot which doesn't cost us in-game time and the rival 
survival number five fight that required some extra grinding. Looking ahead, I could see Agatha being annoying, but the huge concern I have is the champion fight, but there's really only one way to see how that's going to play out. Before heading in, it's that time to use all but a couple of our rare candies, and that gets me all the way up to a healthy level 63 going into the final battles, and I don't know about you guys, but I'm just ready to see how it plays out. On Lorelei's Dugong, there's a clear cut strategy here. It will always use rest, so just chip it down with anything, let it use rest, and then you have a few turns of rock slide to finish it off, and it goes just as planned. She then brings in a cloister, and this battle is nearly a disaster. Rock slide looks like it's going to be a three shot with this insane defense. I get confused, and I hurt myself about 17 times, which is going to be a theme, and I get chipped down very slowly. I'm about to get upset, and eventually I do wrestle control, and a couple of moves moves us on despite cloister getting on my last nerve. Now it's time for slow bro. It can only go for amnesia, and that's exactly what we want to mimic. Since I used candies, that means I'm not going to level up for the rest of the fight, and I'm free to use all three amnesias while Slowbro is stuck in a never-ending amnesia loop of its own. I eventually take it out, and let's see how these final Pokemon shake up. With the amnesias, there's no question that I'm going to outspeed the Jinx, and with the extra attack as well, Earthquake is just an easy one-shot, it's over with. And that leaves Lapras in the back. I go for an Earthquake, it does some nice damage, but it does a Confuse Ray. And now I'm starting to get PTSD from earlier in the fight. As I start to just hurt myself, I go all the way down to HP, but thank the lord that it just goes for wasted moves, and I'm able to get off the rock slide by the skin of my teeth to take this match. This fight was very annoying, but honestly, it couldn't have gone much worse, so it goes without saying that this one isn't too bad of a match, and I'm not going to show it anymore. Now speaking of too bad, it's time for Bruno. Barring something stupid like a crit or an ice punch freezing me, this one should be a free battle. What ends up happening is that I keep getting chipped down a little bit until the Machamp comes in and uses submission to nearly end my life, taking me all the way down to 18 HP, but I was never worried for a single second, and just like that, two battles are down. Agatha is one of my concerns for the Elite Four, and I'm immediately reminded why. I get confused, obviously I'm going to hurt myself, I take a Nightshade, and then I start moving on in the fight. I keep getting chipped down here and there, but by the time I make it to the final Gengar, I actually still have a chance, but I failed nearly every Confusion proc coin flip in this current Elite Four run, and this is no exception. I fail to get the Earthquake off, I hurt myself, and then I take a Nightshade, this one was actually pretty close, but the rough start was just way too much to overcome. The second attempt starts off pretty great, but overall it's the Golbat that causes me the most trouble. It gets a wing attack critical hit, and the typical self-inflicted confusion damage is what does me in. Overall, this is one of the worst Agatha defeats I can remember in recent memory. The third attempt is not much better. I'm honestly questioning reality at this point. I'm being gaslit by Pokemon Red. Do I always hit myself when I'm confused? Does Golbat have a higher crit rate than I thought? Does anyone know the answers? I'm just in a downward spiral at the moment here. The next attempt, it starts off perfectly. A missed hypnosis by Gengar into an earthquake swiftly takes us on unscathed to the next part. But Golbat, it's, it's not done. It's it's gonna be a dumb, annoying, stupid little bitch. I get confused, I hurt myself, and then it uses haze to get rid of the badge boost but I am eventually able to take it out. The next two Pokemon are similar. Without my badge boost to speed, Haunter gets off a Nightshade and an Earthquake does take it out. And then the Arbok is the same. It now outspeeds me because of the Haze and I take some damage from an Acid and you can guess what move I use to one shot it. And that leaves us with the final Gengar. I'm honestly in a really great position here. Nightshade is the only move it has that does direct damage and we can survive it. It ends up going for Toxic and our high attack stat is still good enough for Earthquake to take care of business and as frustrating as this fight may be, it is what it is, and that's kind of how this fight goes. Next up is Lance, and our fighting typing gives us a huge advantage here, barring bad luck on the Gyarados, and that's kind of exactly what happens here. Rock Slide, like we've seen, will not be a one-shot, and a critical hit Hydro Pump basically knocks me unconscious in a bloody little pulp on the floor, but I do survive with 8 HP, and this is what makes Gen 1 so funny to me with its AI. Since the two Dragonairs know agility, they will only go 
for that since I'm weak to it and it gives me the opportunity to boost myself up with mimicked agility of my own. I fully set up and I'm able to cleanly finish both of them off despite being so low. Now the one potential pitfall from our awful start to the fight is the Aerodactyl. With three agilities, outspeeding isn't a concern and Rock Slide does heavy super effective damage enough to get a one shot and we can move on in the fight. The final Pokemon is Dragonite and it suffers from the same problem as earlier. It can't hurt us due to our fighting typing and this one is just all but over but overall, it's just a great example of how AI in Gen 1 makes certain things, certain typings, extremely free wins. Even if you get hit with a turn 1 Hydro Pump critical hit that almost one-shots you, you can still do it. Don't give up. It's been alright up to this point, but guys, we're about to head into one of the most volatile and challenging champion fights in the history of my runs. Let's kind of go over it a little bit so we don't spend too much time on it, and ultimately we'll get to how I got past it. The very first problem in this fight is that you'll never out speed Pidgeot and it will always get off a couple of moves. The absolute best case scenario is that it uses a turn one mirror move on nothing and that's what it does during the first attempt but I don't crit on the rock side and that means I take some more damage. The worst case scenario here is sky attack. It really hurts. Either way it's not too much of an issue because the real issue in the fight is Alakazam being second. The first attempt it sets up reflect and while two earthquakes can take it out the damage is just so heavy that you can't possibly win this battle if you're just trying to brute force your way through it. In this attempt, I desperately try to mimic Horn Drill so I can maybe get the luckiest sweep in the history of Pokemon, but I do get taken out and that's that. Here's a clip of a uh, Sky Attack critically hitting me from 100% health down to zero and there's absolutely nothing I can do about it. You can see some attempts where even when I get some luck later in the fight to make it pretty far, the Pidgeot in the beginning is just so pesky and annoying that it just sets me up to fail. The opening Pokemon has so much power power here that it can make what would otherwise potentially be a successful run into a resounding failure. And I failed this fight a ton. And it's funny that I'm only showing clips of the Pidgeot blasting me because it's not even the biggest problem. And that's really the crux of this fight. It's so front loaded and getting lucky on both of these Pokemon is highly unlucky. Eventually the only strategy that makes sense to me is somehow being able to mimic recover, survive the onslaught from the first two Pokemon. And and then use that to stabilize and finish off the fight. While this run isn't as bad as something like Zubat that we seen earlier, I can't stress enough how many attempts and tries this fight took me to get through. And just from what I've already shown, you guys know what can go wrong. It's really those first two Pokemon. There's no point in me showing 25 minutes of me getting hit with psychic critical hits and sky attacks where I just waste my time, your time, everybody's time. So I'm just going to skip ahead. I'm going to show the successful battle, but it is really important to know that this took me about 50 times to finally make it through. This is the attempt where I get the godlike luck required. On the Pidgeot, I get an opening turn mirror move that misses, which is perfect. Rock Slide doesn't one shot it as we know, but it goes for a second mirror move on Rock Slide that misses. A Sky Attack charge up would also work here, but I avoid all damage going into the Alakazam. The Alakazam is way more important to get great luck on than the Pidgeot, and a turn one reflect or maybe it missing a move is ideal. I take recover here because if I can just survive it allows me to not be dead in the water and have a chance. What ends up happening, the odds are just very low. I can tell you the odds soon. But Alakazam's AI just feels like it gets completely broken here. It goes for nothing but reflect. In all of my attempts, I did see some tries where he would go for reflect two or maybe even three times in a row, but this one right here, I get four in a row, and it's just pure luck, and that's all I can really say about it. Alakazam does have four psychic moves, so I can fairly confidently say that it's a 25% chance for it to use reflect, but a 25% chance four times in a row, and if my research is correct, that should be about as rare as a gen one miss, about one in 256, but do keep in mind that I could have survived one move if it didn't crit and I had recover to get back all of my health. So overall, it was very unlikely, but I didn't even need to get this lucky, but I will take it. From there, I'm miraculously at full health and I still have recover. This has to be the turn. If I died right here, I would be crying. And right on at this point, it's just a formality. There's nothing to worry about. Let's just earthquake this bitch and move on. Gyarados has the potential to be scary and we know how this match kind of plays out. One rock slide's not gonna do it, but it does go for a leer 
and another rock slide moves us on. Arcanine is next, and much like Rhydon, it's weak to our moves and it's not going to put up much of a fight. One Earthquake, and now let's move on to the Venusaur. Right here, I'm going straight Earthquake here, and it looks like it does enough damage to be a comfortable two shot. When it gets its turn, it goes for a harmless growth, and that's it. And I take it out in the next turn, and the battle's over. Machop has done it, and I can't lie to you guys and act like it's not frustrating to take like 50 attempts on a fight and be stuck on the Mimic Recover strat only to have the final attempt end with me being at full health and not even need to use it once, but I'm not going to complain about it. More importantly, let's find out how Machop actually did. Machop finishes with a level of 68, which is one off of the nicest level in the game, but more importantly, it does something that I didn't think was possible. It got a sub 4 hour time, and while it's still about half an hour away from Ghastly's time, 3 hours and 46 minutes in itself might cement Machop as a full time second place Pokemon for the rest of all my runs. Overall, this run was excellent, but Machop did have to retry several fights a good bit. It's kind of like the Bellsprout Syndrome where it can technically win just about any fight, it just might need some help and some resets. Now while resetting and retrying doesn't necessarily affect in-game time or even the criteria I use for the tier list, it does make me contemplate it sometimes. While clearly Machop's time was very impressive and I have no qualms about putting it at its rightful number 2 slot, I can almost factually make the statement that Slowpoke would beat Machop if you took into account real time, but that's probably me just being a homer for my favorite Pokemon. But it was a great run and we might not see many more like this one. Like I said in the intro, Mankey is the other fighting type, and the reason I chose Machop might have made me overlook Mankey since I didn't take into account Machop's awful speed and how that would affect the big battles and heavily affect the early game with Karate Chop only having a 54% crit chance. And honestly, I think Mankey might be able to challenge Machop or at least have a very solid top 5 run. I'm kind of very interested in it, kind of like when I was doing Paris and Parasect. We might see a back to back on that one, but I think that's going to be it for me. Thanks for watching. Watching. You guys have a great rest of your week, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye!